Welcome to this week's episode of the InfoSec and Ocean Show. I'm Josh Amishav. Thanks for joining me again. Today we have Alyssa Knight on the show. Alyssa wrote the first book, at least as far as I know, on hacking connected cars and is a self-described recovering hacker, though unfortunately we don't get into her backstory. If car hacking interests you, you're going to love this episode. My three main takeaways from a conversation were one, where to even begin with hacking connected cars, two, the challenges car manufacturers have when trying to defend against these attacks, and three, how APIs are shaping the future of hacking. You'll enjoy those three things, plus a bunch of other tips along the way. And now, here's my conversation with Alyssa. Alyssa Knight, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Scott. I think I caught you in between sips there. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> If anyone anyone who follows me knows I'm a I'm an obsessive coffee drinker, so yeah, I definitely have a cup of coffee in my hand. All right. So in addition to coffee, you also like to hack cars. H- how does one get started in in car hacking? Sure. So you know, for me, the the difficulty of of car hacking is, of course, the availability of of targets, right? Whereas if you are an API hacker, you can download a purposely vulnerable API like Tiredful API. If you, you know, you can download purposely vulnerable distributions of Linux. And, you know, there's all these things you can download that will allow you to fire it up in a virtual machine and and target it. Hacking a connected car, there's no purposely vulnerable car that you can download and target in VMware. So, you know, for me, it was it was availability or access to the targets like an infotainment system or telematics control unit. Yes, they're in your car that may be parked in your driveway or your garage, but you know, it's still it's it's in a production vehicle. Uh and and it's gonna obviously be a lot different of an engagement, you know, than than a microbench uh, that might be in a tier one OEM that that they might have access to or even working directly for an automaker that might be able to give you a test bench. So for me, I was very blessed in liking the fact that I got to cut my teeth on this with the tier one OEM and an, an automaker in Germany, which is really what got me very involved into car hacking is, is the accessibility to all of these devices that I could target uh, and that were made available to me. So how does one go about doing it? I think definitely access to a vehicle that you can target or hack. You can buy infotainment systems off of eBay. So they have head units that you can buy off of eBay on there. Uh, there's also some telematics control units. So, you know, definitely car part sites. Uh, if you're looking for a device to be able to play around with or hack, you know, eBay and and, and car, car part sites are, are a great place to start. And of course, you know, learning the tactics and techniques in car hacking, get a copy of my book. <laughs> if, if you just had or a... a this or the... Well... <laughs> As you get more details from the book, if if you just had the let's say the infotainment system, and I don't know, like you just put out a video where you were controlling the steering wheel and the gas in, in in the cars. If you just had that, you you wouldn't have complete access, right? It'd just be very limited to what you you'd be able to do. Is that right? Right. So there are different ingress points into a car for hacking a connected car, right? So in the in the most recent research of the video you're referring to was the law enforcement vehicle hack. Those hacks were actually done and were were actually performed through the APIs for the car maker. So I'd hack the APIs and leveraging the APIs, I was able to take remote control of vehicles, start and stop the engine, lock and unlock the doors, pull data from the cars, stuff like that. All this data going to the APIs. Pretty much every car made after 2001 communicates with APIs. So people think, you know, I, I, I can't be hacked because I'm not driving around in a Tesla. Really, any car made after 2001 is connected and they're communicating with APIs. So one ingress point is over GSM, which is the telematics control unit in the car. You can either go at it through the APIs. You could use a, a rogue base station and get the car to associate to your rogue BTS and attack it through the GS through GSM that way. Or there's also Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which is typically through the infotainment system of the car. In some cases, the telematics control unit, if you think of it, it's kind of like the router or the modem for the car that's actually got a SIM chip in it, like a cell phone. That telematics control unit is typically connected to the infotainment system of the car over Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's another, you know, like a USB cable, but in the engagements that I've performed, pen testing of cars, it's typically connected over like a private wireless network 
between the tone next control unit. So those are the three main ways that I attack cars is through GSM, Bluetooth, or Wi-Fi. There's, you know, there's other ways, for example, um, there's a lot of car hackers out there that will go after the OBD2 port, so the diagnostic port within the car underneath the steering wheel. I, I tend to like to focus on attacks on cars remotely that I can, you know, launch from my living room versus having to actually be next to or inside the car. So what are the kind of units that you would, if somebody wanted to do and they didn't have a client with the hardware, what would they need to get? So definitely, you know, like I said, I've, I've found, for example, Harman devices on eBay. So, you know, you've got these different manufacturers that manufacture head units slash infotainment systems. And those are available for purchase on eBay. What, what is a head unit? So the head unit is is basically like the screen in your car where you control the audio. It's the infotainment system. It's got all the buttons on it. It's on your dash. Th- that's typically one of the attack vectors in a connected car. So because usually the head unit has connectivity with it. It's got a USB port. It'll have Wi-Fi to provide a, you know in vehicle wireless internet access. It'll have uh, Bluetooth. So it's got these communication interfaces that you can interact with. The other thing is the telematics control unit. So the telematics control unit or TCU in a car is like the modem or the router for the car. It's where the the SIM chip is within the car that allows it to communicate over GSM and phone home to the back end in what's called OTA or over the air updates. So when I was in the most recent video of me hacking those federal and state law enforcement vehicles on my YouTube channel, uh, I've published some videos around this. I'm actually hacking those cars through the APIs that those cars communicate with. So those cars with their TCU communicate over GSM to the back end, which are uh, essentially API servers. So what I did was I found vulnerabilities in the API servers that allowed me to remotely control these vehicles with my own attacker's token uh, with my account. So in order to attack their car, you're basically essentially attacking the backend API, which then sends instructions to the car. Correct. So when I like starting the engine, it's a simple command. It's an, it's an, it's an API request. It's insane, right? Like, you know, it's just crazy. I, I mean, you can basically control these embedded systems, these devices through APIs by simply just sending API requests. Like you would see an HTTP GET request for a website. It's quite frightening. <laughs> <laughs> you should, if you've seen what I've seen, trust me, you would be even more scared. All right. So when you see a new, say, IoT device or vehicle, is there what, what's the methodology one can use to to start picking it apart? So you know, you've got things like the penetration testing execution standard or the PTES, which is is sort of this methodology for performing a pen test. You start with intelligence collection, reconnaissance, vulnerability analysis, exploitation, post exploitation. So that applies to IoT as well, or to cars. Yeah, it loosely. I mean, you know, I don't sit there and religiously follow the PTES when I'm in a pen test. The I can tell you that Alyssa Knight's methodology, my the way I perform pen testing, especially of labyrinthine systems like embedded systems or connected cars uh, or APIs, I typically just look at how the app works. I look at, so if I'm, if I'm hacking an API and it's a mobile API, I'll download the mobile app and I'll intercept the traffic and I'll look at it and I'll test every single button in that mobile app and see what the button does and see how it works. And then I'll take those commands, those API requests, and I'll put them in my own API client. And I'll send the same request to the API, but I'll just manipulate them. And so to me, that's really what hacking is. It's nothing more than just learning how a system works, learning how the car works, learning how the app works, whatever. And then just sending a stimulus that the developer didn't expect to receive. That's all hacking is to me. And you know, so for me, yes, there's these frameworks for how you are, you know, can perform a pen test step by step. But for me, it's 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 a lot more simpler than that. I simply just try and figure out how something works and then I pull it apart. But then and, the, and the I, curve I, scenario, though. So can you like if there's a web app, you you set your proxy, you set your browser, use a proxy, you can capture the, the traffic. Right. In the car scenario, how, how does that work? So in the car scenario, if I'm targeting the APIs, I'm the, air, the car makers make mobile apps, right? That you can remotely control your car with. 
uh, a lot of the, like if you buy a Mercedes, if you buy a Honda, a Ford, whatever, they have an app now that lets you, hey, I locked my keys in my car for some, somehow. I can unlock it with my mobile phone. So these are all API requests that are sent from the mobile app to the API. So when I'm when I'm performing a penetration test of a car, first I'm going to try and see if it's possible to hack the car through the API. So I'll grab the mobile app, and then once I grab the mobile app, I will then intercept the traffic and try and figure out how the API works and how the mobile app controls the car. So that's one way. If I'm physically local to the car, I'm I'm around the car. I'll I'll actually fire up a rogue base station and see if I can get the car to associate to my rogue BTS. And if you control the network fabric of that the car is using to communicate with the back end, you can intercept those packets. You can look at those packets and see what is actually being communicated between the car and the back end and then manipulate that. So well, how close do you have to be to the car to do that? I'm afraid to ask this question. Well, yeah. So, you know, you can pick yourself up like a Blade RF um, from Nuance. You, you, as long as you have your SDR software defined radio, you know, you can... It depends on on you know what kind of antennas and signal you're pushing out. But I mean, basically, you want to project the strongest signal than the legitimate cell tower. So if you have a if you have a blade RF hooked up to your laptop, you want to be as close as possible and project the strongest signal. So the car associates to your rogue base station instead of the legitimate cell tower that may be nearby. And by design, it's going to associate to your rogue base station if you're projecting the stronger signal. Okay, so you got to be pretty close. I mean, I, I've I've been, you know, down the street. I've been in the same parking lot. I've been right up next to the car. Uh, okay, that's not that close. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it depends. I mean, you could be as close as I mean, you know, it's it's all about it. It's all about the vicinity to the legitimate cell tower. If there's a cell tower like standing right next to the car, you, you're gonna want to project an even stronger signal than that. You know, so I mean, but typically in most cases, the cell tower isn't going to be that close. It's not like the car is going to be right up on top of the cell tower. So, you know, usually it's going to be many blocks away, you know, several miles away. I mean, you just want to be projecting a stronger signal than the legitimate tower. Are there any defenses that car manufacturers should be putting into the vehicles to protect against attacks like this? Yes. <laughs> All of the above. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things that's interesting that I found out in my research all these years was there's by design, there's actually a flag or an indicator within the frame that actually will warn you that you are associated to, for example, a a base station that's got encryption turned off, right? So there's an actual notice that the cell providers are disabling and not showing to users on their cell phone that their cell phone is currently associated to a potentially rogue base station that's got encryption turned off. Because here's the thing, if I'm running a rogue base station and I can get your cell phone or my connected car to associate to my rogue base station and I'm in charge of that network, I can disable encryption and I'll be able to see all of the data going between the car and the back end. If you can decrypt it, you can see what the commands are. You can see what you, you know, you're able to replay that traffic or manipulate. It. So ideally, what car makers should be doing is warning the driver that the car is currently connected to a rogue base station and encryption has been disabled, potentially leading to something that could lead to loss of you know, life or safety. But how do you do that with the average American? How do you do that with the average Joe or Jane on Main Street? Let's say you pop up a warning message on the dash and says, you're connected to a rogue base station. There might be, you know, a hacker might be potentially trying to kill you right now. What is the driver going to do? Like they're not, first of all, they're not even going to understand what a rogue base station is. They're not going to really understand what the ramifications of the car being connected to a rogue base station is. What are they going to do? Do they, do they pull over and call 911? Like, this could be, you know, I mean, it's that whole thing of is it, is there such thing as providing too much information? I don't, I don't know what the answer to this is. You know, obviously, I think a car should be designed not to not to associate to a cell tower where a five zero encryption or encryption is not turned on. Right, just don't associate to the tower. Go offline. But what do you do about the fact that cars are meant to be mobile? Cars are meant to move. 
And you might be in an area where there is no A53 or whatever encryption. You know, what if you're in an area or even in countries like China where you're not allowed to use encryption that the government doesn't have keys for to be able to decrypt? That's a real problem. I talked to the, the tier one OEM about this very problem. Well, we ship these head units into China. What do we do where you are in a country where the government doesn't allow strong arm encryption that they can't decrypt? You know, so we have to allow this head unit to be able to associate this car to be able to associate with uh, a station that has encryption turned off, you know, so or weak encryption. So, you know, it's a real problem, whereas you've got a network that isn't moving. A traditional computer network doesn't move. It's in a building. It's in a data center. It's somewhere that's not moving. These are networks wheels. They're constantly moving. So how do you how do you control that? How do you secure that and enforce things like encryption when it might be traveling in an area outside of that? So there's no easy answer or no answer at all. No easy answer. No easy answer. I mean, you can't really pull your car into the parking lot of a Best Buy and say, hey, where's what aisle do I go to to buy you know, an ECU firewall or a TCU firewall for my car? They're going to look at you like you're crazy. You know, there's... Unfortunately, on the consumer side, there's nothing we can do. We just have to do better and be better when we're shopping for cars to ask those hard questions. And when we're researching what car we want to buy, start holding manufacturers responsible for making sure that they pay the extra money for security controls like ECU and TCU firewalls and that they perform penetration testing of their vehicle. Those are the kind of things we as consumers need to start demanding of the people making our cars. Is there any publicly available information about which manufacturers are doing that? That's a good question. I don't know. I I would say like, you know, definitely look at the brands that might be sponsors of automotive security research group like ASRG. Uh, Look for look for car makers that are heavily involved in industry security conferences like, you know, S car, that sort of thing. It just, you know, I have my particular brands that I have a lot of confidence in simply just because I've performed penetration testing of their cars. So I, <laughs> I'm i driving around in a car that I hacked. You know, I, I, I was part of the vulnerability management process for addressing those vulnerabilities and issues, and I'm driving in that very car. So, you know, um, I have my particular cars that, that I have a lot of trust in because I know that they require penetration testing from all of their vendors that they work with. A lot of people think that cars are made and built by that car maker that's not the way it works mercedes honda ford they're just doing nothing but creating this big bastardized stack of other companies products it's and and throwing wheels on like it's not all the components and all the parts inside a car is not made by ford it's not made by honda they they they're piecing together all these different products from different companies so the head unit is made by a company. The telematics control unit is made by another company. You know, what you want to do is these automakers is you want to make sure they're requiring penetration tests of their vendors they work with, their suppliers. You want to make sure that, you know, they're they're adhering to automotive spice and a lot of these other risk management frameworks. You want to make sure that they're they're showing some sort of report that they identified and mitigated vulnerabilities and did static and dynamic code analysis. Because there are more lines of code in a connected car today than there is in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. You know, there's, there's over 100 million lines of code in a connected car today. You know, it's insane. You know, it's, it's, our cars are nothing but computers. They're software. So Akamai had a study a few years ago that I think it was 83% of, of their, the CDN traffic that they see are APIs talking to each other. What's that mean for the, for the future of hacking? So... You know, for me, it's it, that that's a really interesting statistic because, and and I and I use that quite often. You know, and it's it's the thing is is that more than that means that more than half of the traffic uh, uh, flowing across CDN networks today is no longer human to application traffic, and we're now definitely in a world of APIs. We're in an API first world now. APIs are now being required by the within healthcare in, in our country. We have a deadline coming up where healthcare payers and providers by the ONC are mandating that they use the FHIR standard uh, to make p- electronic health records available to patients. 
And both providers and payers need to be able to support, deploy, and use Fire APIs to share that data. We have the financial sector with open banking and also PSD2 in the UK and Europe. You know, you have APIs everywhere. You have cars talking APIs, financial systems, mobile apps. We're in a mobile app world. Everything's communicating with APIs. And the problem is in the vulnerability research that I've been doing lately is we are really bad at securing those APIs. Uh, I recently published some studies, as I'm sure you saw, on me hacking healthcare APIs that gave me access to tens of thousands of electronic health records in those APIs uh, because there were so many vulnerabilities with them. I'm publishing research right now uh, that I've started research in hacking fire APIs. Uh, I recently published that research into taking remote control vehicles through the APIs. So I believe that this is really the future of everything is APIs and microservices. And we're not doing that great of a job at securing them. We have to understand the concept of shift left security and shield right security. So not just you know securing applications when they're being developed, but also securing them once they're in production as well. So from a testing standpoint, how does API testing differ from, let's say, web app pen testing? So that's a good question. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that most web application penetration testers start to uh, kind of have that deer in headlights when they're targeting an API. As soon as they see a JSON response, they freak. freak. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's and again, that's kind of where I like to focus my vulnerability research is the more labyrinthine areas of security that, that there aren't really many pen testers out there that understand. You, know, you can't really throw a rock and hit somebody that knows how to ha hack a connected card just because they're a pen tester or hack an API just because they're web application pen tester. It's different tools. You know, it's it's not as simple as throwing, for example, Nessus at, at or you know, any web application security scanner at an API. It, it, a lot of it is understanding how the API works, looking at the stimulus and response and, and manipulating that, looking for things like broken object level authorization. One of the things that I'm finding that's very systemic across the vulnerabilities I find in APIs is a lack of authorization. So we're doing well at authenticating API requests, but we're not doing that great of a job with authorizing the API request. So just because I'm authenticated and I'm allowed to talk to an API, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm authorized to view the data I'm requesting. So that's a real problem. And a lot of the APIs that I've hacked are vulnerable to... Uh, authorization vulnerabilities like BOLA, broken object level authorization, where, for example, if I send a request to the API, get slash API slash v2 slash josh 001, and I change that in my API client to be get v2 API slash josh slash you know, 002, right? So just changing that you're on requesting a different object ID and if the API allows me to do that, that's a broken object level authorization vulnerability. I'm authenticated. I'm allowed to talk to the API, but I'm not authorized to see the data I'm requesting. Okay. In terms of the tools, though, would you still be using something like Postman and Burp to capture the requests and then start manipulating them either manually or through an automated fashion? Yeah. So um, it's a combination of Burp Suite where, you, you know, obviously you've got the proxy capabilities in Burp Suite to be able to intercept that mobile traffic to the API. It has a built-in Chromium browser that will allow you to hit web APIs, which is cool. And I'm doing a lot. I'm using that for my current fire research. Uh, you've got Postman, which is an API client that will let you create API requests from scratch instead of replaying it with Burp Suite. The other thing is is fuzzers. So one of the things that I'm actually in the process of creating content around right now is how to fuzz APIs and using things like Wrestler or Kite Runner in order to fuzz the API. And a fuzzer is nothing just doing but sending a bunch of API requests, looking at the responses based on swagger files or slash open API files that it grabs on the internet and seeing how the API responds to that. And then based on its response, modifying those API requests and forwarding those on as well. So right now, there's, so there's several, I can tell you that there's several exciting things coming. There's an amazing API hacker that I'm absolutely a huge fan of. Uh, who's working on a machine learning based API fuzzer. There's a company working on an API fuzzer that uses ML as well. So ML is really changing things. And the fact that it can be a lot smarter than static requests, like something that a Nexpose 
or or a Nessus scanner would throw at it, instead of going through just a text file full of API requests, it's using machine learning to really create different permutations of those API requests based on how the API responds, creating and generating a new permutation of that and sending that to the API and seeing how it responds. So we definitely, when you're doing API hacking, you definitely need more sophisticated tools that can do things a lot more than just like a Metasploit, you know, auxiliary scanner. You want to use things like you mentioned, Postman, Burp Suite, or an API fuzzer. Let's talk a bit about securing APIs. You talk, would you suggest something like, like a mod security or what other, or like, how would you, how would you approach that? So I, I did this recent live stream. And if you haven't seen it yet, I would urge your audience to go take a look at it on my YouTube channel. So I did this live stream on the state of the API security market. I actually had the opportunity to present on the state of the API security market to Gartner, uh, which was to me very ironic. But, you know, the API security marketplace is very nascent right now. I believe it's very nascent. It's still trying to figure itself out. It's very much kind of, I think the market has an identity crisis right now at the moment. There's all sorts of different, it's very fractured. There's all sorts of different approaches to securing APIs. You know, web application firewall companies think that you can do it with a WAF. A lot of the APIs that I breached, a lot of the APIs I hacked were secured by WAFs. So I don't believe that WAFs are the answer um, because they can't identify logic-based attacks, meaning that they don't know just because I'm authenticated, am I authorized to see this data? They're more rules-based, right? You have API threat management solutions that hang passively off of span ports. You have companies that are in line and think that you know the the answer to the API security problem is to interdict that traffic and decide whether or not it's synthetic or human generated and pass it on to the endpoint. So you have all these different solutions and different approaches to API security. You know, I think I think. A lot of them are great approaches. Uh, you know, you have the 42 crunches of the world that it's shift left where they actually insert themselves into the IDE and analyze the code as you're writing it and tell you and yell at you when you're doing something wrong and securing it once it's in production. You have, you know, traceable um, that's doing things with distributed tracing and asset inventory of your APIs and telling you what kind of data those APIs are serving. You have you know, um, salt, which is, you know, believes that the answer is, is hanging off of a passive span port instead of being in line and that you shouldn't proxy it, you know, so you have, you have a proof that believes that the answer is compiling an SDK with your mobile app and nothing can communicate with your API unless that SDK, uh, unless that API request contains a token generated from that SDK. So you have all these different approaches to API security and they're all great solutions and great approaches. It's really, it depends on the kind of data you're serving. It depends on the architecture. It depends on, you know, what exactly you're doing for your environment. Okay, good answer. All right, when, after you run a pen test against an API uh, or any application, you'll normally come up with a list of vulnerabilities and, and the company is probably running their own vulnerability scanning as well. And there seems to be this massive information overload with the amount of vulnerabilities that need to be taken care of. How can companies manage the risk that all the their applications have in a more effective manner? Because the, the time from discovery to patching seems to be getting longer and not shorter. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and this is a systemic problem and has been for many years. You know, if you look over the last couple of decades, we, you know, we really haven't gotten any better at this. You know, it doesn't matter how many tools are out there for identifying vulnerabilities and missing patches. You still have that breakdown, but you know, in DevSecOps and you know the, the breakdown between infrastructure and operations and security and actually getting the vulnerabilities that have been identified mitigated. Even if you create help desk tickets and assign them to IT people to take care of, and you still have this long time between vulner, uh, vulnerability and patch identification and actual mitigation. So first and foremost, let me preface this with the fact that I hate the concept of CVSS scores. I know I I never liked them. I don't think they're effective. You have to patch vulnerabilities that have a CVSS score of X and above. I mean, it it I think it's dumb. To me, I what I care about are the vulnerabilities that I I can remotely exploit and give me a shell on the machine or give me, you know, remote code execution. You know, the critical vulnerabilities that are not being firewalled off, I can reach from the internet, you know, those kind of things. 
what are the vulnerabilities that I exploited during a penetration test in a live fire exercise? Those are the vulnerabilities that should be patched immediately. I'm a big fan of breach and attack simulation. You know, instead of this that concept of generating a 6,000 page PDF from Nessus and saying, go fix these, breach and attack simulation gives you like one or two things. Hey, here's the kill chain that it followed in order to gain access to this secure enclave where some your CDE environment is or whatever. So I think I think the answer to your question is I I don't think I agree that the approach is to run a vulnerability scanner and give that scan report to the customer. I I just don't think that that's the right approach. I've always been a big fan of real life scenarios, live fire exercises. This is what the hacker was able to do and these are the vulnerabilities they utilized to get there. These are the ones we need to patch. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in go fuzz yourself, go hack yourself, you know, and, and fix those vulnerabilities that were found. Because to me, that's a real life scenario. We all know the pink elephant in the room. The company isn't going to fix every vulnerability. And much to your point, a lot of times it takes them six months, a year, whatever to patch them. I ran into one company where I was coming in for an annual pen test and they told me to come back next year because they still weren't done patching the vulnerabilities from the last pen test a year ago. This is this is our world that we live in. And unfortunately, that is what puts us at a huge disadvantage with adversaries. They know that our our time between vulnerability identification or zero day exploit. Look at how many companies that got compromised from that Citrix vulnerability. You know, that that Citrix announcement, vulnerability announcement went out months and months later before that or months after the announcement, we were still dealing with incident response cases with companies that hadn't patched that Citrix vulnerability. So, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a zero day announcement or you find it yourself. Companies are taking months to get things patched. And, you know, I think I think companies need a really tight vulnerability and patch management process and procedure. I think it needs to be enterprise wide. I think um, the CTO and the CISO need to come together and, and come to agreement on what what vulnerabilities are patched immediately and what you know what aren't um and i think those are those should be the critical ones those are the ones that are found in a pen test identified in breach and attack simulation or identified as critical cool so you talked about your uh, your car hacking book and then we briefly talked before about the uh the api hacking book that's coming up when, when can we expect that when can yes. we get a copy i'm excited yeah, so we're going to be I'm actually going to be making a major announcement regarding that API hacking book here soon. But that's that's good. that's due out in the beginning part of 2022. So that is, so we you know we just got the contract. We're working on actually writing the book. We're expecting it to come out like Q1 of next year. So if we if we beat the timeline, it should actually be the first book out on hacking APIs. Um but I'm going to be doing several book launches and book signings early next year. Um, at different conferences um, that I'm planning. But yeah, so Q1 of 2022, I think is is the best answer. Okay, and the book focuses on offensive testing for APIs, right? Offensive testing, yeah. We're also going to be talking, obviously, about securing APIs properly. So we want to not just kind of put out there that the sky is falling. We want to give guidance to CISOs and defenders on how to actually properly secure their APIs because I don't believe, based on my empirical data, of my actual API hacking research, that APIs are being secured properly right now. They're not. You know, a lot of organizations are still using WAFs to secure APIs or API management solutions, API gateways, secure their APIs, and it's the wrong tool for the job. It's like trying to hammer in a screwdriver with a hammer. All right, to close things up, if uh, people want to learn more about you, where can they where can they find you? Sure. So definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, hit that bell icon for new uploads. I, I live stream and upload every week. Definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, so I you can find me in all the, the, the typical places, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you having me, Josh. I, I look forward to possibly being back again, and uh, especially when the book is, is published. Definitely. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks again for listening and for leaving reviews. If you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear from you. I'm at Jamus on Twitter or drop me an email at podcast.breachdance.io. And if you're part of a security team that needs visibility into your employees, customers, or third-party suppliers' breach credentials before criminals exploit them, head on over to breachdance.io to apply for a free seven-day trial. That's it for this week, and I'll be back in your earbuds next Thursday morning.